Hi there and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast and in this episode uh, I'm going to look at some of the uh, events from 1945 onwards in America that uh, lay the kind of groundwork for the anti-communist era that lasts until uh, the mid-1950s and uh, normally it's it's common to look at uh, a sort of a rather top-down approach um, in this this period of time of um, various uh, parts of the the political establishment uh, persecuting um, a wide range of, of, of figures on, on the left during the kind of the uh, earliest and the most intense phase of, of the Cold War but here um, I, what I want to do is look at tensions within the trade union movement. I always find that uh, examining divisions and schisms within the left is really, really instructive when you're looking at the politics of uh, democratic societies. Now, previously on this podcast, we looked at the, the Taft-Hartley Act and the impact that that had had on uh, organised labour uh, in the, the late 1940s. And we looked at um, Truman's uh, antipathy towards uh, the trade union, move, union movement. Truman um, vacillated between um, outright hostility um, and a, a belief that the trade unions um, and pay bargaining in general was some kind of treachery. All the way through to uh, feeling that in some instances the anti-union laws had gone too far and uh, some of the working class base of the Democrat Party were, was threatened uh, as a, a result. In the uh, late 1940s, um, the unions uh, attempted to break the power of uh, anti-union bosses in the most de-unionised, uh, politically right um, and pro-employer part of uh, America, which was the, the South. Um, the AFL and the CIO, the, the two uh, umbrella uh, union bodies, uh, both had their go at trying to break um, anti-union, uh, anti-union power in the South. The CIO spent a million dollars and took on 200 organisers in 1946-47 to um, and pursued what was referred to colloquially as Operation Dixie. Um, in order to uh, extend its interests uh, and interests of workers in the South. Um, the, uh, the, at the beginning of uh, Operation Dixie, text, the textile industry in the South, uh, obviously the South being kind of the main cotton-producing region in the country, along with state governments, organised a, a firmly united front uh, against uh, the CIO. Um, the uh, other main body in the South, the other main sort of uh, employers um, grouping in the South uh, were um, agricultural, um, the agricultural industry, farmers and uh, large agribusinesses. Um, also united uh, in order to prevent there being any kind of uh, workers' movement developing. Um, and this was, uh, this intersects with uh, racist sentiments in the South, racist um, tradition, the racist traditions of the South, um, and employers and uh, anti-union uh, politicians draw powerfully on the racist sentiments of white workers um, using all sorts of arguments uh, to put forward to uh, the white working class that trade union membership would give uh, black workers the upper hand over white workers or that white workers would be reduced to the kind of the same servile level as their uh, uh, black counterparts. Um, And the CIO was associated with um, the civil rights movement. Probably inaccurately, um, there was... Um, little to suggest in the AFL and the CIO that they wanted equality between white and black workers, um, but it was a useful ploy for driving wedges between white and black workers in, in the South. In uh, Birmingham, in Alabama, which was obviously a steel city, 
white steel workers were uh, united in rejecting um, the uh, demands of the local black workers there who had organised uh, in a um, under a, a communist trade union the mill uh, the mine mill and smelt workers union um, in uh, Mark Nyson's brilliant book uh, Black Communists in, in Harlem uh, during the 1930s uh, he makes it, it clear that the, the communist party in Harlem and communist trade unions were for for black workers really the, the only show in town it was the only um, political uh, organisation the, the communists that were that was likely to um, treat black workers with anything approaching e equality. Um, unions that were dominated by white workers, which didn't have the kind of radical emancipatory politics that the communists had, um, were um, often mired in um, racial politics. The idea that this union should be for exclusively for white working class men and that um, white working class men weren't in the business of fighting for the rights for um, poor, lower paid blacks who would be able to un undercut them. These were kind of popular I ideas. In, by 1948, it was uh, abundantly clear that Operation Dixie hadn't worked. Uh, unions uh, in the South um, had smaller percentages of non-agricultural labour um, by 1955, than they'd had in 1945, so actually union membership had gone down. Uh, and one thing that became abundantly clear from these struggles in the South um, was that um, a schism within the trade union movement had opened up. It wasn't simply that the trade union movement per se was accused of being communist um, by their um, detractors, it's that within the, um, the uh, trade union movement, there were communist and non-communist unions and non-communist and non-communist union leaders. And therefore, the union movement itself would become one of the battlegrounds for the, the coming um, domestic Cold War in uh, America. And the fears of communist subversion would be focused on, in part on, on the trade union movement. Um, by 1945, there were a number of unions, including the United Electrical Workers, the International Longshoremen's Union, and the National Maritime Union, the Mine, Mill and Smelters Workers Union, uh, which either had communist leaders or followed the Soviet party line on political and economic issues. Of course, if you were part of a communist party, you were by extension going to be part of the Communist International and take your lead uh, from uh, Comintern, which was an incredibly fraught um, and politically dangerous uh, path to tread in 1945, when all of a sudden, not just the government, but popular opinion shifts towards the political right and a deep suspicion and antipathy towards the Soviet Union emerges. The superficial uh, bonds and affections of the wartime alliances, uh, which were only ever uh, surface, never, never ran particularly deeply, these are swept away. Most of the communist unions were affiliated to the CIO. Twelve of the 35 CIO affiliates in 1946 had communist or strongly pro-Soviet leadership and uh, a million workers belonged to these unions. So from the, the paranoid perspective of um, anti-communists in Washington, there seemed to be uh, an awful lot to be concerned or worried about. But also in the AFL and the CIO, there were um, popular, well-known, well-established and charismatic uh, union leaders such as Walter Reuther who had had run-ins over the last two decades with um, communist trade unionists and found them to be doctrinaire and untrustworthy and belligerent and suspicious and all the kinds of um, things that really split the labour movement. Um, the the non-communist left 
um, democratic socialists and those on the left, generally on the left of the Democrat Party, also found their dealings with communist trade unionists uh, extremely difficult. These were uh, union officials who uh, took their um, cue from Moscow and were uncompromising in the party line. In 1947 and 48, as the uh, the Cold War really um, develops, you have events such as the Truman Doctrine uh, and the, the Marshall Plan and the uh, Berlin Airlift, um, the uh, schisms in the labour movement become much deeper and occasionally violent. Um, one leading uh, trade union wrote to the CIO, uh, trade unionist wrote to the CIO, executive board saying, if communism is an issue in your unions, throw it the hell out, and throw its advocates out along with it. And the following year, um, communists, the, the same uh, correspondent wrote to the CIA referring to communists as sulking cowards, apostles of hate, and dirty, filthy traitors. The CIO, uh, in 1949, expelled 11 unions and uh, disaffiliating them. Um, and these comprised of 900,000 workers, or 900,000 union members. What was the case in most of these unions is that there were a significant number, if not a majority, of uh, union members who were themselves not communists, who did not either A, uh, have any interest in um, what the line, uh, the party line coming from Moscow was, or B, if they did have any interest, um, agree with it in, in any way, shape or form. The political leadership of most of these trade unions was not representative of the rank and file membership. But even worse, the existence of communist trade unions or uh, trade unions led by communists enabled later on um, the likes of Senator McCarthy to uh, allege that the trade union movement in general was either soft on communism or complicit in the crimes of communism. And because of this, it uh, allowed uh, the more paranoid uh, and authoritarian figures in the anti-communist uh, witch hunt to suggest that the union movement was an example of internal subversion, um, that the union movement was therefore for dangerous. And it also allowed um, this idea to spread to other aspects of um, worker solidarity. Uh, and the reality was that there was a very small number of communists amongst the trade union movement. But um, it, by pretending or alleging or claiming that the communism was widespread, it gave opportunities to suggest that any kind of worker solidarity was uh, dangerous troublemaking and uh, potentially gave opportunities to the USSR. And this played neatly into the hands of employers who uh, were happy to uh, accept a de-unionised workforce uh, in the 1940s and 50s. The expulsion of communists from the CIO and the disaffiliation of uh, communist-led unions from the CIO was a, a deliberate ploy by the CIO to uh, appear uh, in uh, the early years of the Cold War, as far away from Soviet communism as possible. The only problem is that um, the Persh unions, their leaders, had been elected by democratic vote of the members. Um, and therefore, what the CIA was doing was fundamentally undemocratic. Um, one of the uh, activists, Paul Jacobs, who, who rather uh, reluctantly supported the purges, um, said that, um, and I quote, all serious debate within the CIO um, came to a standstill. In some unions, it became a habit to brand as a communist anyone who opposed the leaders. And by the mid-1950s, um, the uh, spirit of anti-communism had swept all before it, within the, the union movement. Uh, 
and anti-communists um, were in control of the, the labour movement uh, across America. Um, the unions thereafter, instead of being uh, organisations of uh, worker solidarity for uh, collective pay bargaining and uh, instead of being uh, able to support one another uh, across industries, you know, pretend they, uh, present the threat even of, of general strike in the future, unions became much weaker organisations and instead of um, pursuing broadly um, work, uh, pro-working class um, left-wing ideas, they became what James Patterson describes as um, special interest groups uh, rather than supporters of broad-based liberal ideas. Um, and so they also become a weakened force within national politics, the, the trade union movements, in Europe and America in the 1930s uh, were active in demands for uh, broad social reform. After World War II, uh, because of the spectre of Soviet communism in America, at least, that comes to something of a halt. Um, within the Democratic Party uh, in industrial areas, Unions were um, kind of a hostage to the, the, the Democratic Party. Obviously, they were uh, the Republican Party were utterly hostile towards the, the trade unions, and the the Democrats less so. But the unions became far more dependent um, upon them, and they were uh, unable to really engage in politics without the Democrats. Uh, in um, rural areas and among black Americans, working women, and uh, other non-unionised um, Americans, there was little influence. Um, and it was social reformers in America who argued that the decline of union power in the 1940s and 50s was part of the reason for a kind of renewed conservatism uh, in the 1950s, and part of the reason why um, social reform uh, takes a, a significant step back during that, that period of time and um, only really to be kind of reinvigorated during the 1960s. The irony of, uh, of this period uh, is this, is that um, at the end of the Second World War uh, and the, the death of Franklin Roosevelt, the, the New Deal was by and large, um, highly thought of its critics had been silenced by Roosevelt's war record, and it was in, entirely possible that a, a, a liberal and social democratic uh, age would, uh, would dominate. There was nothing to suggest that the, um, at the end of the Cold War that the population would, uh, at the end of the Second World War, I beg your pardon, that the population would shift to um, the right. And there was nothing to suggest that uh, liberalism, um, the, the American conception of liberalism, which I suppose you could describe as social democracy, there was nothing to suggest that that wouldn't um, be in, in the ascendancy um, in the 40s and 50s. A majority of the population supported not only the Democrats, but the broad principles of the New Deal, having seen the effectiveness during peacetime and in war of uh, state intervention. And the arguments um, about a, uh, a free market, a deregulated free market economy, hadn't really uh, managed to kind of re-implant themselves in popular consciousness and wouldn't do for uh, another generation. The Democrats were able to count on uh, loyalty uh, from uh, minorities, from uh, rural minorities, black people, uh, the working classes, um, from trade unionists, uh, Jews and Catholics. And all, all of these minorities have significant voting clout. Um, the Democrats, however, were um, starting to see very gradually at the end of the Second World War, falling voter turnout. Um, and Truman himself was no Roosevelt. He didn't have the 
elan and the charm of Roosevelt and was certainly immensely disliked um, mid-term by uh, many of the groups that I've just cited, particularly the trade unionists, for, for very good reasons, as, as we've seen in the last few podcasts on, on this topic area. Um, so Truman did endorse new, the, the New Deal and his own fair deal, um, and, uh, and, and yet he was becoming gradually less and less popular with the traditional Democrat base. The Republicans, of course, uh, get the unequivocal support of uh, their um, normal backers, uh, the American business classes, and also have uh, the conservative or Southern Democrats um, in uh, the, uh, the House who would uh, ally with uh, the Republicans to undermine uh, progressive measures and had done during the, the 1930s. The idea that the state was able to solve problems um, was still firmly uh, an article of faith in uh, 1945 and would be probably up until the, the 1970s when um, a, a right-wing counter-revolution takes place uh, under Ronald Reagan with these various kind of Ayn Randian sort of notions. And the GI Bill was, uh, and I've talked about this in, in previous podcasts, the GI Bill was an extraordinary example of how um, state intervention and the, the granting of um, state uh, subsidies to returning GIs in the terms of in terms of cheap house loans and um, uh, loans for to set up businesses and to pursue educations had a, a massively uh, revitalizing effect uh, on the economy. So, given the fact that this was a uh, an almost left of centre republic. How did uh, the uh, beginning, how did the elements of McCarthyism and the anti-communist era take hold? Well, as with all um, conservative with a small c counter-revolutions, uh, persistence is the key within um, the political, economic, governmental and media elites. There are always... Uh, figures who believe in, uh, if not in a smaller state, then in a, certainly a more authoritarian state that has the power to uh, intervene um, and to monitor and to um, curtail rights when, when, when necessary. Um, if you think that later on, the, the kind of the Reaganite right of the late 70s and early 80s, believe in rolling back the state. The extreme economic right uh, in that regard is very very much fringe in the 50s and 60s. However, the extreme authoritarian statist right, the likes of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, for example, these are the figures that really are, are um, in ascendancy on the right in uh, the 1940s and 50s. And they actually have the levers of state control and a greatly expanded bureaucracy in order to uh, achieve their, their aims. Now, I'm going to finish here and we're going to uh, continue in the next few weeks on uh, looking at the, the origins of McCarthyism. Um, you can find out um, some of my long-form journalism on the Explaining History a Patreon page. I've put a few... Um, long articles on there about matters various recently. If you can go there, uh, check it out, and obviously uh, any uh, patrons are greatly appreciated. It helps their podcast to keep going. Um, and I'll look forward to speaking to you all soon. And feel free to say hi at the Explaining History Podcast Facebook group. All the best. Thanks. Bye-bye.